everybody. Um, oh, that's loud. Uh, hello, everyone. Well, we're about to get started, but before we go, I just want to take a moment to say thank you to our gold sponsors, Skylight, Mozilla, Intel, Chef. You guys are great. We would not be able to do this without you. Thank you very, very much. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about what's going to be happening over the next year in Rust. But before we do that, of course, I want to look back about what's happened in the past year, sort of roughly since Rust Camp last year, which was also more or less the 1.0 release. We've all been working pretty hard, and a lot of things have come from that. So we've had a lot of progress, for example, in the library. When we first released 1.0, you may remember we had a kind of minimal but stable API surface. We've expanded that dramatically. We've added 175 new features to the stable list, covering all kinds of areas. Uh, so you can now really use the standard library for most tasks that you need on stable, which is great. We've been building a lot of language features. Um, so for example, specialization, infiltrate, the question mark operator, now the macros 1.1 one, one RFC, and I'm sure there's a lot of things I've forgotten. These have all been designed, gone through the RFC process, have been implemented. They're all on nightly now at varying degrees of completeness, and hopefully they'll be making their way to stable in the not that distant future. And in the meantime, while doing that, we've re-architected and re-implemented a lot of the compiler. So we added a new internal representation, which we call Mir, and it's now on default. It's now the default uh, backend on Nightly. It's going to be the default backend on Stable in a release or two. I think it's on beta. I can't remember. Yeah, it's, it's enabled on beta, in fact. And with that, we've already been able to add, for example, more efficient code generation around drop, which is a dynamic drop, something we've been discussing for I don't even remember how long before we got it to work. Uh, and we are now recently released a kind of incremental compilation is starting to make progress. We're in an alpha period. It's working, except we have a lot of bugs to fix to make it get better reuse and before we're willing to let people, uh, before we're willing to recommend that you use it, let's put it that way. But if you're a brave person, you can give it a spin. And we've been doing a lot of work on error messages lately. And I think that work's going to continue. We're trying to make them more readily understood, better formatted, more attractive. Um, so finally, we've been working hard on cross-compilation. We have a Rust-up tool now that lets you switch tool chains very easily. And we have a lot of tool chains available. And you can kind of customize it per directory and so forth. So I could go on and on about the technical details. But I think what's most exciting is that in the year since we released it, Rust has remained kind of a language basically a language that people love to use, right? And that we love to use, and that is really great. Uh, so one indicator of this, but there have been many, was this Stack Overflow survey where Rust came in on top with 79% of people who use the language saying they want to keep using the language. Um, so that's really cool. <laughs> and we have a Friends of Rust page now where people who are in industry can sign up, or I guess anyone betting money on Rust is kind of our catchphrase, can sign up and get their logo on the page. And there are now, when we started, there were a few logos. There's now 35. And you can kind of watch a video here where I awkwardly scroll through the list because I can't figure out how to make it work smoothly. Someone should tell me. But you can see there's a lot of logos there. <laughs> um, so pretty cool. Uh, and finally, the Rust community itself as evidenced by this conference right here, but it's starting to really grow. And so we have, if you believe meetup.com, we have 14,000 people attending Rust meetups around the world. We have a new community team that's working on mentoring and uh, other opportunities. We have three conferences taking place this year. So there's RustConf here, and then another in Pittsburgh and Berlin. Um, so there's a lot of excitement about Rust, and we're really excited to see it happening. But for that, I'm going to turn it over to Aaron for some kind of prognostication about the future. <laughs> Thanks, Nico. Um, yeah, it really has been a remarkable year. And, and before I get to the prognosticating, I just want to sort of echo the theme that, you know, for me, the most exciting thing on a daily basis is just the Rust community, the level of, you know, passion and energy and kindness. Um, so I think, you know, that's what keeps me going day to day, and it's only getting better. Um, so thank you all for that. Um, yeah. <laughs> OK, so that said, you know, I think what's on a lot of our minds here at the conference is where do we go from here? Um, what's ahead for Rust? And you know, I'm happy to say we don't actually need to look at a crystal ball to figure this out. Um, in fact, the Rust core team has been putting a lot of thought into how we set out a vision for the next increment of Rust. 
how we execute that vision, how we communicate that vision. Um, and so uh, there's been a, an RFC recently that Brian Anderson from the core team wrote up, sort of laying out some thoughts on how we build this process. And so I want to walk through a bit of that just to sort of frame out what we're going to talk about in the keynote. Um, so this is, this is the new Rust, map, uh, Rust roadmap process. So the heart of this process is uh, the idea that every year we're going to come together as a community and try to set out a vision for the next year of Rust. And the way this should work is we spend some period of time really gathering a lot of data, uh, doing things like the Rust survey that went out, talking to production users, uh, talking to people as we're trying to teach them Rust, as we're doing outreach in conferences, you know, anywhere we can encounter people using Rust or trying to use Rust, we want to hear from them, hear what kind of problems they're encountering. And then take all of that data, sort of try to digest it down, and talk as a community about what are the biggest problems that are coming up. And from that, build out some themes for the year and you know, sort of a realistic vision of one year from now, how can we have knocked down some of those obstacles uh, to using Rust? So this process is already underway. Um, hopefully, many of you have already participated in the thread. But if not, there's, there's a thread on the internals forum that's basically starting this conversation. And it's going to go for most of the month. So please join in. Um, in the meantime, this keynote is going to make a pitch for a particular part of that vision that I think is really important. Um, but before we get there, there are these other aspects I mentioned before about you know it's not just setting out the vision, but it's how do we execute it? How do we communicate it? So another core piece here is we want to start a milestone process where every six weeks, sort of aligned with our release cycle, we'll be setting a GitHub milestone. And that milestone will contain the work that the various teams that are part of the Rust community are trying to do toward our vision. Right, so the idea is, at least every six weeks, we're taking a step back, looking at what we're trying to do in the year, and making sure we have a concrete increment that is actually taking us in that direction. So you know, that's good on an organizational level. Um, but I think also, at, you know, I've been sort of saying communication is really important here. The goal is anybody you know, in the Rust community, so I think a lot of you are Rust enthusiasts and are sort of up on things, but people who maybe aren't following so closely, it should be really easy to you know, hit up the Rust homepage and figure out where is Rust heading, what work is going on, how can I get involved in, and help Rust achieve its goals. Right? So that, that's a big part of what we're trying to do here. And you know, one last piece of that communication front is at the end of the year, right, as we complete one of these cycles, we want to take a look back and see, how did we do? You know, did we actually knock out the problems we wanted to? You know, where, where did we fall flat? And then synthesize all of that into a kind of retrospective that we can release to the world. So every year, we want to put out sort of a story about where Rust is going um, that everybody can listen to, and, and that gives a, a really coherent narrative. Um, and that should be looking at the whole ecosystem, right? not just the compiler, not just the language. OK, so that's, that's the big picture of the roadmap process. And like I said, the keynote is really going to focus on this, this vision aspect. Um, and you know, I mentioned that we want this to be driven by various sources of data. And one of the big ones is uh, the Rust survey uh, that the community team put together a couple months ago. And you know, I think we were all blown away by the results of this survey in a lot of respects. Um, you know, one of the biggest being how many people responded. Right? So we got over 3,000 survey responses. And one thing that's really exciting about that is over a third of those responses came from people not yet using Rust. Right? So this, if you put this all together, we actually get a pretty informed picture of the obstacles people face, whether they're using Rust or whether they would just like to use Rust but you know, aren't able to for one reason or another. Um, so let me go through some of the challenges that sort of came up time and again in the survey. OK. So far and away, the biggest challenge we would see is the learning curve. Right? This, this is a theme that was repeated in one in four responses. Um, and I think you know, what, what we often hear when we talk to people about Rust who have come to love the language and are sticking around is, well, the first two or three weeks were pretty rough. Right? I had to like, fight a lot with the bar checker. I, there was a lot of new stuff to learn. It, it wasn't easy. But after I got over that hump and really started to understand what the language is, was about, I fell in love. Right? And that's a great story, um, but we can do better, right? Because we're losing a lot of people on that early part of the curve, right? So that, that's going to be a major theme. Um, another one we hear often is the library space. Um, so Rust is a very young language, right? Only a little over a year out from 1.0. 
Um, and so while the ecosystem is uh, growing really quickly, oh, we're really having some slide difficulties here. Um, so while, while the ecosystem is growing quickly, uh, you know, there's perhaps more we can do to focus on building libraries that people need. Um, another piece is just overall maturity, so not just in the library space, but also tooling, like compiler performance, debugging, and so on. There's, there's more we can do. Uh, one thing I think that surprised a lot of us was how important IDEs were on the list, right? So if you look at all 3,000 responses, it was like one in 19, but if you narrow to the, you know, a third or so of people not yet using Rust, IDEs came up a quarter of the time as the reason that they were not yet using Rust. And that's really interesting. And I think in a lot of bigger production shops, IDEs are an essential part of people's workflow. And basically, if your language doesn't have a good IDE story, you're just a non-starter. Right? So this is a huge thing that we need to be looking at. And of course, compiler performance, um, which I think we're all pretty well aware of. And this is something we hear a lot from production users as their number one complaint as they start getting bigger code bases, compiler performance is a big problem. OK, so, so those are some of the sort of high level takeaways, I guess, from the survey. Um, but that's a lot of stuff. So I want to sort of step back and try to identify a common theme running through all of these issues. And I think you know, through the survey, through conversations, through thinking, like the way we're looking at this is productivity is key. Um, there are lots of different ways to look at productivity, lots of different questions you might ask in terms of is a language productive, is an ecosystem productive? But I think the biggest obstacle to Rust today is its productivity. So zeroing in on that a little bit, right? there are some aspects of productivity that Rust gets really right today. Right? So if you need to write a piece of code that is reliable, Rust is a great way to get there quickly. If you need to write a piece of code that's fast, Rust is a great choice for that. Right? So we have, we have some good strengths here. But then there are these other pieces that don't really sound much like Rust. Like, Rust is a fast way to get up to speed writing code, or Rust is a great language for prototyping. Right? These, are, these are not things that feel very true of Rust today. And it's tempting to think that there is a fundamental trade-off here, right? that Rust has some core values around performance and correctness. We're placing those above all else, and one of the things we're sacrificing is early learning curve or getting teams up to speed really quickly. Let me tell you about trade-offs. So here's a slide from Rust Camp you know, last year that was trying to sort of sum up what the 1.0 release represented in terms of you know, what Rust is at heart. And I think probably all of you have seen these slogans if you've been around in the Rust community. But each and every one of these things represents an apparent trade-off that Rust has been able to overcome. Right? Before Rust came on the scene, you would think that, well, you can have memory safety if you have a garbage collector. But if, if you are foregoing a garbage collector, good luck getting a memory safe language. Well, Rust gives you both at the same time. Right? Or if you want to do concurrency, especially shared state stuff, you're going to struggle with data races. Well, not anymore. Right? Rust lets you do concurrency of all kinds while guaranteeing data race freedom. Right? So I think a big part of the spirit of Rust is having our cake and eating it too. I think it's something we're really good at. And so my challenge to the Rust community this year <laughs> is to do it again. Right? So we all know that speed and reliability are core values of Rust. I think productivity needs to become a core value of Rust too. And we need to find a way to have all three together. Right, so with that, we're going to go through some of the different teams and aspects of the Rust project and look at what it means to have productivity as a core value. Right, so when it comes to the language itself, I think it's, as Aaron said, it's important to kind of look and realize when it, in terms of being productive while also having code that runs fast and is reliable, we've done a pretty good job so far. Right? I mean, what do people love about Rust? I can tell you what I love about Rust is this feeling of kind of galactic power at my hands. Right? I can just like throw a few lines of code, and then what I want happens, kind of like a wizard or something. Right? So I can write an iterator like this that takes a string, breaks it into lines, finds the maximum, or the lengths of the lines, finds the maximum. And not only does it look pretty, 
I, mean, I could do that in a lot of languages and have it look pretty, but in those languages, it would probably make an object for every line and it would be kind of slow. But in this version, it's as fast as some C code that has a little pointer and skips along, right? Um, or I could write a snippet of code to traverse over some paths, load up a bunch of images in parallel, and collect them into a vector. And it just takes a few lines of code. And again, I could do that in some other languages. But if I made a mistake, I'd have data raises, and maybe 1% of the time it just doesn't work the way I expect. A few images get lost, something goes wrong. I don't have to worry about that in Rust. Or using this newer work on futures that Aaron and Alex have been working on, and also Carl, we see um, we can send an RPC request out, and we can get back a response and process it. And it's a few lines of code, but it performs really well. Right? So here's a little chart that they put up in a blog post. And you can see that here are some servers that the different kinds of servers implemented in different ways processing hello world requests. Right? Now, if I told you, don't look at the labels yet, if I said, which of these do you think was written in the language with the strongest safety and reliability guarantees and using the most kind of idiomatic abstract code all the way down the stack, I know what you'd say. You'd say the fastest one, of course, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's not what we normally think. We normally think we have to trade one or the other. But Rust has really turned that on its head. I think that's something we can all be really proud of. What we find people saying a lot, and what I feel also, is that over time, right, with the language, the compiler becomes kind of like a trusted pair programmer who's kind of got your back, who's looking over your code, helping you think of cases you might have overlooked before. And so even in this simple little routine that takes in an optional string, which is the name of a user, I guess they might want to remain anonymous or something, and prints it out, we already can kind of see some of that. And so we have the option type in Rust. So instead of using a null pointer for the string, which we could overlook, we have to notice that maybe the user doesn't have a name, and we have to customize our greeting for that. And we don't get some kind of null pointer exception. And of course, this is a reference to an option of string, which is the key to the whole kind of house of cards we built up here. Not house of cards, the wrong metaphor. Key to this beautiful structure <laughs> that we built up. Uh, <laughs> Basically, you know, it's, it's what lets us have safe, uh, not need a garbage collector and avoid data races and so forth. And we can indicate that with just this one sigil. So that feels good. So, you know, I feel pretty good about this code. If I take it to compile, of course, I know it's going to work, right? Oh, wait. No, it's not going to compile. I'm going to get this mismatch types error. That's a little bit, uh, a little bit <laughs> aggravating, but that's OK. I know what the problem is. I'm an experienced Rust programmer. I just have to put this star here because I don't want to match on the reference. I want to match on what the reference refers to. So I have to dereference it. OK, good. Now I can compile the code, and everything's fine. Except, oh, yeah, right. I can't move out of borrowed content here. That's all right, too. I'm an experienced Rust programmer, I know. The thing is, when I say sum of n, I'm taking ownership of the string that's inside the option. But I can't do that, because I've only borrowed this option. So I need to borrow the string as well. And I write ref to make a reference to the string. And now if I recompile, it's going to work. And so this is, you know, these are minor annoyances when you know what to do. Uh, it's still a little bit unfortunate that I, my code looked a little prettier before. Um, but you can get used to that. But if you're an experienced programmer, that's how it feels, right? But if you're coming for the first time and you're still trying to understand what ownership and borrowing even are, this could be a total game changer. This could be like, I'm just going to walk away from this language. I can't even print a string on the screen. I'm feeling a little frustrated. And so, Unfortunately, I think there are a lot of places in Rust where we take what we surface these kind of small details constantly, right, to the user. And, you ha and you, once you learn to deal with them, any one of them is not a big deal, but they can kind of build up. So here's another example, a pretty common one. If I have a function that takes a string, you'd think I could call it with a string literal, right? That seems logical, but I can't because string literals are compiled into the binary. We don't have to free them afterwards, so they have a different type. That makes a lot of sense. There's a really good technical reason for that, but it's not necessarily a reason that I care about at any particular point in time. Right? And it's particularly not a reason that a lot of new users are familiar with. So when I do my introduction to Rust tutorials, literally the very first thing I talk about is this. Right? OK, let's just talk about strings for a second. And it's kind of a shame, because it's not the most exciting topic to, to, to cover first. But so a similar example that I think a lot of us have experienced is that you know, if I have a reference to a map and I get a key from the map, then when I find the key in there, I now have a reference into the map and I've borrowed the map. And I can't mutate it. And that's kind of the basic system. We can learn those rules. 
But when we come, if we find that the key is not present in the map, we still can't mutate the map, right? Because the, the checker has a kind of lexical notion of how these things work, and it doesn't understand control flow as well as it could. And that's something that can be very frustrating when you're, if once you understand that it works on a lexical scope, you kind of get it. But before that, you might think you don't even understand the whole borrowing system, when really what it is, you don't understand how dumb the compiler is being right here, right? It's not as, it's not seeing it the way you see it. So this is a list of some of those things that bother me or that I've heard about. You probably have your own. I'd like to hear what, <laughs> I'd like to hear about them actually. Not right now, afterwards. Um, <laughs> but so I think as these are kind of, all of these exist for a reason, right? There is a technical reason that these distinctions exist, and sometimes it's very important to have control over these details if you want your application to work right. But it's not always important, and it would be really nice if you could kind of choose these details in a few places and let the compiler work out the rest of them for you, right? And then if we do that, I think what we'll find is that this trade-off we see where it feels like these explicitness and total control are at odds with nice ergonomic programming, we can kind of resolve that and just sidestep it and have it not be an issue whatsoever, right? And I think part of the reason that I'm confident we'll be able to do this, I don't have solutions for all of these problems necessarily, though we have given a lot of thought to most of them, and I think we have good proposals that we'll put forward. Um, but if we look back, we can see, we look back to these kind of galactic power examples I showed before, we can see that a lot of these trade-offs are there, or there are trade-offs there that we've just managed to hide and take care of, right, and resolve. So for example, the biggest one I think is closures, uh, or biggest example of this trend. Closures is something that are like a fundamental building block for abstractions, right? You see that every one of these examples has a closure, if not more than one closure. And it took us a long time to get this design right because they have to be usable in so many different situations. You have iterators that stick within one thread, you have multi-threaded programming where the closure serves as the body of a thread, then you have things where the closure is being run in parallel with itself many times, like in the loading images example, right? I'm running that same closure for every image. Uh, and the RPC is a little bit different. And so balancing all of those trade-offs seemed like it was gonna produce this kind of infinite family of closures where the user has to pick just the right thing. But what you'll notice is in the syntax and, and in these examples, we don't really see all of those trade-offs at play, right? They're there, but they're not right in our face. And so an example, a specific case would be, if you look at this variable, my socket, this is something from the environment. It has to be either borrowed or moved or mutably borrowed into this closure, but I don't have to say that, right? We figured it out based on how it's used in the closure. If you moved it in the closure, then you need to own it. If you only referenced it, we can take a reference and so forth. And so I think closures is an example where we did a really good job collecting a diverse and seemingly contradictory set of constraints and resolving it into one kind of ergonomic but also fast and reliable uh, abstraction. And I think we can do similar things for some of these other examples. So if we look kind of at this matching case that I showed first, you could imagine that instead of requiring you to say if a binding is a ref binding or not, we examined how the binding is used and we figure it out just like we do with closures. So you might say, ah, this println is, doesn't need to own the end, it can just printing it, I can make this a borrow, right? And similarly, instead of making you dereference name manually, you never really want to match on a reference. That's not very interesting. You're always looking at what it's referring to. Maybe we can just skip over those, uh, through those references, right? And then the code that I originally wrote would have worked in the first place. But it would have worked the same way that my final code did, right? Just as efficient. Similarly here, with the string literal, uh, if we could extend the string type to know that sometimes it is containing memory that comes from the static binary, instead of being always a heap allocated buffer, then it wouldn't have to free it when it goes out of scope. Then we could allow a coercion from the string literal type to string. And this code would just compile, and better yet, uh, it wouldn't do any allocations or anything like that. So it would be as efficient as if the user had typed and take static stir as the type instead of capital string, right? It's not that this distinction is going away, it's just that we're surfacing it differently, um, or less. And so finally, this example, if you've been following Rust for a while, you're probably pretty familiar with it, the map example. And here, I think we've, we have a kind of well-known solution to this. We can make the compiler smarter about control flow. That's been a long time coming. It's been a very challenging, but now the mirror is in place. We've kind of got the pieces there. We have everything we need, so hopefully we'll be seeing that. And again, we can kind of overcome this 
make these rules basically just simpler to work with, right? And if we've done all of this, right, the language, we have not given up any reliability. We haven't given up any performance in any of these examples. We may even have gained some in some cases, like if we can prevent some allocations for strings. But instead, we've just made it nicer to use, right? And I think that should be a big goal for us. So when we think about new language features, we tend to think about exciting new capabilities, extending the language in some way, do something it can't do. And those are important things, and we have to keep those in mind, especially if they sort of unlock an important domain for us. But we also can look inwards and say, OK, what, what are we doing now? How can we tune it and improve it and make it more productive than it is today? So all right. Thank you very much on that, but let's talk about libraries. Thanks, Nico. OK, great. So you know, every team has something to contribute here. So from the library perspective, what does improved productivity mean? Um, so that's, that's kind of a big question. Libraries are a big topic. Um, but I think there are a lot we can do just at a very basic level, right? So when people in the survey talk about libraries or maturity being an issue, I think what they tend to be talking about is they have some pretty basic need uh, for a library to do some work they're trying to do. And they want that kind of library to exist in the ecosystem. They want to be able to find it easily. And when they start using it, of course, they want the library to be of high quality. And you know, what I think high quality means, of course, is fast, reliable, and productive all over again. So that's a fairly basic kind of goal to shoot for. I want to spend a few minutes on sort of each of these dimensions, highlighting some specific things we can do to improve our library story. Okay, so let me start with libraries that should exist or should exist in a more mature fashion. Um, I think one thing that's been getting a lot of attention recently um, that people are very excited about, myself included, is Rust on the server. I think this is one of the biggest opportunities we have for getting Rust into production. I think there's a lot of interest from really high-scale internet companies in, in using Rust you know, in exactly the cases where Rust has a lot to offer. Um, but it's also a huge lift, right? What, what does Rust on the server even mean? There's so many different subdomains, right? So we're focused right now on building the foundations for this story. Um, you know, 1.0 shipped with a ba very basic I.O. story that was uh, blocking I.O., which is fine for a lot of things. But when you want to scale up to a big server, async I.O. is essential. Right, and so we've been developing a story around futures, which I think really gets at the fast, reliable, and productive trifecta. Right? Um, so there's a lot of excitement around it. It's very new stuff. There's going to be a lot of iteration. But I think async I.O. is going to be a big theme this year. But that's, that's just the foundation. right? Just having async I.O. doesn't mean it's easy to build a server. Right? So on top of that, you need protocols. You need you know, HTTP. You need to talk thrift. Um, you need to talk to databases and so on and so forth, right? So we want to work on the next level up on the stack. And there's the Tokyo project, which is focused on that. Um, and then on top of that, you want middleware and so on. So there's, there's potentially a whole ecosystem here to develop. And I think it really deserves to be a major area of focus for Rust community this year. Um, sort of related to that, and one of my favorite topics, is parallelism and concurrency, right? I think. Rust concurrency story is one of the most unique things about the language, right? The fact that you can freely use concurrency without being terrified of data races all over the place. I think that's really cool. Um, and you know, I think we've got some good examples. But I don't think we're fully delivering on that promise today. And the reason is you know, we have the basics in the standard library. You can sort of see the vision. Um, but we don't have that fully productive story across the board yet, right? So what I want to see is like Nico's Rayon library, which he you know, didn't point out that he was showing his library earlier uh, in the galactic slide, um, but it was there. Uh, and, and I think it's really cool, right? This, this fact that you can you know, just change from iter to par iter, and all of a sudden you're getting parallelism totally safely. Right? I think there's huge potential there, but we've really got to push on those libraries to get them to a 1.0 state um, where people feel confident using them in production, they have good documentation, they, they're starting to feel mature. Right? So I think there's a lot of good work we can do maturing that part of the ecosystem this year as well. Um, for a lot of you who are using Rust today, serialization may be a sore spot um, in that uh, you're probably using Surti. Surti is really cool. But Surti traditionally has required a nightly compiler, and that's all kinds of painful for the ecosystem. Um, so we've got some really exciting stuff in the works with Macros 1.1 you may have heard about. 
Um, the TLDR is we want to get SERTI unstable as soon as possible. Um, and it's looking like, you know, within the next few months, that should be on the horizon. Um, and then looking a little... <laughs> <laughs> So, so looking a little farther afield, um, you know, I think there are more specific domains where Rust might have something really interesting to offer that we haven't, as a community, sort of really highlighted or put a lot of weight behind. Um, so numeric computation, scientific computation, machine learning, um, these are all places where scale, performance, reliability really matter. Um, and if Rust can couple that with a highly productive story, I think we could do great things. Right, so this is another place where there are some great libraries out there. You know, there's like ND Array, for example, um, but they need more sustained attention to get to a, a really 1.0 place to build a foundation. Um, and I would love to hear from all of you, again, after the talk, uh, on you know, what, what other gaps in the library ecosystem are really holding you back. Okay, so that, that is sort of about getting libraries to actually exist. Um, but once they're out there, how do you find them? Right. So, you know, discoverability superficially seems like a fairly easy problem. Um, just use Google, you know, or do a search on Crates.io or whatever. But it's actually really subtle, right? If you are trying to use Rust in production and you need a, a library, um, you want to very quickly establish that, you know, this library is going to meet your needs, that it's well maintained, that it's high quality, and so on and so forth, that's compatible with the rest of the ecosystem. There are a lot of attributes that you're looking for beyond just does this library exist. Um, and so then we start getting into things like, you know, curation and rating and so on. But there's a tricky balance to try to achieve there, right? Because we want to highlight the best libraries and, and draw people toward them. But first of all, what does best mean, right? We all have different ideas about what we're looking for in a library. And we have to calibrate that in the right way so we incentivize the right things. Um, but I think even more concerning, right? Rust ecosystem is very young. There's a lot of innovation waiting to happen, and we need to be careful not to uh, sort of coalesce around a particular library when something better could be coming down the pike. But now that we've like highlighted this one, you know, first mover advantage has locked it in, right? So somehow we gotta navigate this balance, and it's gonna be a tricky thing. I think one source of inspiration here is projects like Ember Observer. Um, you know, so uh, Ember is a JavaScript framework. Uh, it has a big community around it and faces similar discoverability problems. Ember Observer tries to curate the ecosystem um, in a pretty sophisticated way. So there's sort of a mixture of like objective criteria, like does this add-on have good documentation? Does it have tests? So on and so forth. And then there's some measure of actually human review. And that, that all gets put into a score um, that then, you know, highlights uh, add-ons in particular areas, right? So maybe something like this could work for Rust. And we won't be starting from square zero here. Uh, there are already some good curated lists of libraries in Rust um, that we can draw inspiration from as well. But I think um, we're approaching the time where actually having some official curation and search tools, discoverability tools, is a pretty high priority. I'd like to see them on Crates.io personally. Okay, so that's, that's discoverability. Um, the last thing I mentioned about uh, you know, what you want out of libraries for productivity is quality. And my perspective here is we want to focus on ways to improve quality across the board. Like what kinds of tools can we build that make it easy to produce high quality libraries that sort of raise the tide for everyone. Um, so documentation is a really important example, right? Um, if a library is not documented, it might as well not exist for a lot of people. Um, and uh, you know, I was super pleased to see in, you know, in the last month a new site pop up, DocsRS, which totally automates the documentation system. Right? So if you have published a library to Crates.io and you go to DocsRS, it's docs are up, basically, um, without you having to do any work. Uh, You know, and I think there's a lot of interesting potential there for actually integrating docs across libraries so that the ecosystem feels very coherent and you can, you know, if APIs are being shared across libraries, you can browse from one to the other and so on. So I think that's a really important area to keep focusing on. DocsRS has made huge strides already. Another related thing for quality, obviously, is testing. Um, and as with many of these things, like, Rust is already in a pretty good place, but we can aim higher, 
right? So we have good CI tools. We have Travis integration and so on. But you do have to know how to set it up. There's some work to get that going. Uh, we could make that more push button, right? We've done that in a lot of places. Why not have Cargo New automatically generate Travis integration for you? Something like that, right? Um, and then similarly, Rust comes out of the box with uh, a unit testing framework, and that's great. Um, but we could really open the door to more custom testing and benchmark frameworks and you know, the sky's the limit in terms of what the community can do. So I think that, that's another really important area to focus on. And then looking more at the code itself, um, I think there are many important questions about Rust the language as you're developing a library, particularly if you're writing unsafe code. You know, what can you assume about safe code? What do you have to guarantee? Um, it, will future versions of Rust break your unsafe code? Right, these are some tricky questions. Uh, so we've recently formed a strike team to start laying out some of these guidelines and actually starting to specify these core pieces of Rust. That's gonna be a long haul. This is really hard work, but I think it's, it's vital to the long-term quality of the ecosystem, right? And we should look for other kinds of things like this, like restarting the API conventions uh, system you know, so we have good documentation on you know, how you should be designing your APIs and so on. These are all things we can do to, to increase library quality across the board. Cool, okay, so that was the library story. Let's look at um, one more team in a little bit of detail. Um, so the, the tools team, right, has, encompasses quite a range of things. Um, I'm gonna focus on just a, a few here, and I think tools are one of the places that have the greatest potential to improve productivity, right? It's like the obvious thing. Um, so Rust Up was a really exciting thing that came out this year um, from Brian Anderson. Um, Brian! <laughs> Right, so, so probably you all know RustUp is a way to get Rust itself to upgrade to new versions, but it's so much more than that, um, right? The vision is RustUp is a way to acquire tool chains for things like cross-compilation, right? And this is another place where we really want a push-button experience. So if you want to develop on a Linux box, make an Android app, we want there to be one line you write to RustUp to say, I want Android, and it'll download everything necessary on your system uh, you know, NDK-wise to actually get that done, as well as the, the Rust tool chain itself. Um, so we have some pieces of that today. The NDK support is uh, an ongoing thing. Hopefully we'll have some news there in the next couple months. And then Brian, again, has also been hard at work on getting Rust uh, hooked into Emscripten and, and Wasm. So that's compiling Rust down to JavaScript to run on the web, which is amazing. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential there. And again, RustUp you know, will be used to, to acquire those tools. Um, another thing that's really important for productivity is not having endless bike sheds about code formatting. Um, and so we have the Rust format tool. Thank you, Nick, um, for spearheading that effort. Uh, but of course, we have yet to actually reach consensus as a community uh, as to what that format should be. So Nick, very bravely, is heading up the bike shed of bike sheds. Um, so we have, we, we now have uh, a Rust format strike team, which I think had their inaugural meeting uh, earlier this week. Um, and the plan is to actually uh, lay out Rust format conventions um, that set the defaults for the tool that the whole community can use. And so we can just not think about this ever again. Um, okay, and then uh, last of these core tools is, is car Cargo, which of course everybody loves Cargo. Cargo's a great draw for Rust. Um, but there's more we can do. So, you know, one of the pain points in the ecosystem uh, is to do with the way that Semver is managed and the way that uh, dependencies of a package um, may or may not be duplicated under, under various circumstances. I don't want to go super into detail, but basically there are some pain points um, managing this process right now. If you have a dependency that is not actually um, sort of exposed in your API, so we have some ideas about making a distinction between uh, dependencies that are basically private to you and ones that might matter to your clients. And we think that this will you know, help Cargo scale up to a larger ecosystem. Um, another really important area of focus, uh, as we've started to talk to really large shops that uh, want to use Rust, one of the holdups is they tend to have really large build systems with really large opinions. And Cargo has its own opinions, and it's not clear how to integrate this. Um, so, you know, again, we have some initial ideas about what this might look like. Um, 
if this is a problem for you, talk to Alex uh, or Yehuda, um, and uh, let's get to the bottom of it. OK, but of course, um, IDEs are the, the big topic for tools, especially given the survey results. So we've made a lot of progress on IDEs in the last year. Um, probably a lot of you have seen or used Racer. Um, so Racer is not an IDE, but it's sort of part of a package that could go into an IDE. And it aims to provide things like autocomplete and go to definition really, really quickly. And it does this in a pretty heuristic way, so it's not actually using the compiler at all, because the compiler's not quite there yet, speed-wise. Um, and uh, Racer has come along you know, quite a long way. So there are already like, some good tools in that direction. Along a very different axis, we have the IntelliJ uh, Rust plugin, which is also rapidly maturing. IntelliJ uses a whole different approach. They have a very intense sort of framework for writing IDEs, which is basically building a whole compiler themselves. Um, so they have started this process for Rust, and things are coming along quickly. But I think you know, one of the things we're excited about in this space is to try a somewhat different avenue, right? So, so far, the plugins that are out there don't talk to the compiler at all. And you know, partly that's for performance, but it's also a shame, because you're missing out on some things that you could be getting if you were talking to the compiler, like the ability to accurately refactor um, you know, or get perfect answers uh, to um, you know, questions like go to definition or find all references and so on. Um, so uh, Nick and Jonathan, who are going to be demoing in just a second, um, have been hard at work in this space. And the vision is we have an IDE. Maybe it's VS Code. Maybe it's Atom. Maybe it's something else. It's talking to a central service called the Rust language service which is then, in turn, talking to some variety of sources of answers about your code. So when you need a fast turnaround time, maybe you talk to Racer. When you can take a little more time to get you know, something more detailed, you talk to the compiler. Um, and they've been making amazing progress on this tool, and I'm going to shut up and let them show it to you. Yeah, OK, cool. So as Aaron was saying, we had this idea a couple weeks ago. Uh, what if we took like a best of both worlds um, approach? We use Racer, we want something that's more interactive, and then we can use the compiler, the compiler's metadata directly, when you want something that's a little bit more deep, like precise knowledge about your project. So we wrapped it together into this prototype, very early proof of concept prototype, um, uh, idea of this Rust LS. So the, the RLS allows us to do the same kind of things that you already are used to doing in Racer. So for example, we can do the same autocompletes that we did before. Um, it gives us a list. We can scroll around and pick a, you know, a method that we want to call. And you saw as we were selecting that, that we had type information sitting there that Racer had already kind of parsed and figured out. But what can we do if we have like, you know, precise type information? So if we have precise type information, for example, we can hover over things and see the types. Uh, if there is Rust docs, we can see the documentation. And so this is starting to feel like, oh, this is starting to feel like a little bit more like an IDE. Um, you can see the, the squiggle here, for example. So we have errors. You know, we're using the compiler behind the scenes. If we hover, we can see the error. Um, we can see a little bit more about what's going on. And of course, since it's straight from the compiler, it's exactly the same errors the compiler would give you. So we can do um, you know, types on hover. We can do error messages. The next thing that we need to be able to do is to do navigation through your code. So we can do to, uh, like a, a go to symbol. So just type the name of a symbol. And then when we do, we can jump straight to its definition. So you've seen some tools already out there that can do this kind of thing. But with the precise type information, we can just go straight to the definition. Um, we can find all the references for a given symbol, for example. And here you see, you know, like the full list of where that symbol is being used. And again, this isn't like searching through your code like grep. This is the precise information. And if we have the precise information, we can kind of go that next step that you're used to IDs going. We can actually use that to do a refactor. So we can. Wait. Oh. I just want to point out. Oh, yes. 
So uh, this is inside a macro that we found a reference here. So we can see right through macros. We can see really complex types of the generics and so forth because we have the whole power of the compiler behind us. Thanks, Nick. I knew I was going to forget that one. It's like, remember macros, remember macros. All right, so we can do final references. And if we can do final references, again, we can do this refactoring to be able to rename that symbol and precisely rename it rather than doing search replace because we know all the references, we can do a safe uh, rename refactor. <laughs> so we're really excited about what this can grow into. Again, like I said, this very early proof of concept, lots and lots of duct tape. Uh, but we want to tear that duct tape down and build it back up to being the real RLS. Uh, we kind of showed it working in VS Code. But of course, we built it in such a way that you can plug this into any IDE, any editor. And if you want to help us move it onto the, your favorite IDE, uh, just come talk to us later. We'd love to hear you. All right, thanks. So the last thing I had to say is basically that we have also a lot of efforts from other teams. So the docs team, for example, is embarking on a new book based on what we've learned about how people learn Rust, trying to take a different approach that uh, should be more effective um, and improve on the one we have, which is already quite good. We're also they're also working on looking at different ways to improve the ecosystem documentation as a kind of uh, community-wide effort. And then we have a new community team, which is focusing on assembling new learning materials and especially working on a Rust bridge effort in collaboration with, or as part of, I guess, the Bridge Foundry, which is going to essentially learning Rust as your first language from the ground up. And of course, the compiler team is hard at work on making things faster and less buggy and nicer overall. And so that's about all I had to say. Um, if this comes up, I do want to show you this picture, but it's not, so I won't. It's too bad. Uh, oh, something. Aww. Oh. <laughs> That's all right. Sorry, right, we're done here. Thank you guys very much, <laughs> and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.